1787, before any humans touched foot on this island, it had over 100 plant species nowhere else on the planet, 70 species of land snail. Seabirds were driving the ecology here with their nutrients. And the soil was being enriched by invertebrates burrowing, by the rain of phasmid poo from the forest above. They were the cows of Lord Howe. They were the major chewers of leaves. So the ecology here was being supercharged by seabirds, was being fertilised and driven by these invertebrates working the undergrowth. By the time the first people started living here in the 1840s, we'd already had several extinctions and that continued and continued and then accelerated when rats got here. Rodents first arrived here with mice in about 1869 and then rats arrived here in 1918 when the supply ship that was coming here regularly from Sydney to supply the locals hit a rock off Roach Island just to the east here and had to run itself ashore on Ned's Beach which is just on the eastern side of the island. There was a piano on that ship and inside that piano was a rat's nest. That piano got brought onto the island with its rat nest in it. But what likely happened is once the ship hit shore, the rats just poured out of it. By 1921, the Australian Museum came here to look at some of the forest ecology. By then the locals are saying their crops were getting stuffed birds are disappearing, so the forest was already becoming quiet and the, and the locals didn't know what to do because these rats were everywhere. Three years later, everywhere. We know soon after the rats arrived, five species of birds disappeared. Slowly over time, we started losing a whole range of invertebrates. Some of our snails disappeared. Um, we know that uh, the Lord Howe Island stick insect was no longer around. There is extinction of several plant species. So we were dealing with a situation where we weren't even sure we we're about to lose the common golden whistler on this island, which is an endemic. And so what was here was still here, but how long it was going to last, we don't know. It may have been years, it may have only been months. There was some research done prior to the REP on the rodent density and pretty much came up with between 200 and 300,000 rodents across the island. So the, they, were, they were everywhere. We used to purchase about five and distribute five tonne of bait per year, every year, at a cost of over $100,000. They predate animals, they eat seeds, they eat seedlings, they exclude animals from nesting, they disturb things. Um, they, they were eating our, our vegetables and fruits eating the eggs of invertebrates. Uh, they were eating crabs off the beach. Uh, you'd go to the beach and every morning you'd see little rat paws on the beach. You couldn't plant large sort of seed, like corn seed, bean seed. And within two nights, every one would be eaten. So the rats and mice were having an impact every day, every night. We've got a, a project um, where we're monitoring four critically endangered land snails. These species of snail only occur on Lord Howe Island and they're restricted to two mountain tops largely. Um, they're also important nutrient recyclers, so they're important for, for keeping those ecosystems um, functioning well. Prior to rats arriving on Lord Howe Island, there'd been surveys for these species. And for most of the species, we were getting large number of records. And then come um, the arrival of rodents, those records dropped dramatically. Yeah, well, the long-term consequences were not as easy to recognise immediately because it's, it's much more of a, a, a slow burn. And so you have a mature forest and there is no regeneration from seeds. Eventually, when the mature trees fall over, there's nothing to take their place. and then you would lose everything that relies on the on that ecosystem. With some of the, the bird life that was lost, they would just climb on branches and either eat the eggs or the, the chicks. We also have done studies on some burrow nesting petrels, and we found that with uh, black wing petrels, for example, where a breeding success is expected to be about 50% for a, 
borrow nesting petrel, we were getting breeding success of only two to three percent, um, and in some colonies, uh, complete failure. By the year 2000, many hundreds of islands had successfully had rodents removed. The complication with Lord Howe is there is 350 people who live here and call it home, and they have up to 400 tourists on any one day on the island. And we needed to get everywhere to remove rats and mice. Basically, every rodent had to be exposed to a bait to deliver a successful eradication. So it involved having to get baits in every property, which required a significant amount of uh, community liaison. Obviously, the rodent eradication is very science heavy and the communication that we had to provide around that fell into a number of different categories. Uh, we needed to communicate to visitors to the island. We needed to communicate to the community. We also needed to have people understand exactly what we were trying to achieve by the rodent eradication. The plan was to bait by air using helicopters with a spreader underneath, like a fertiliser spreader. And that was to bait most of the island. Then we had to work out what species were going to be impacted by the bait. So we actually put one and a half tonne of bait on the island without poison in it. My job was to actually catch all the vertebrate species on the island, all the bush birds, the bats, and actually look at their faecal material to work out whether they'd been eating the bait. So that told us which species were probably going to need protection and which weren't. And it came down to currawongs and wood hens. So only a small proportion of currawongs would eat rats, but the fact that they were, it's an endemic subspecies. So we brought 50% of the birds into captivity. We know from our trial baiting, the wood hen loved the bait because they ate the non-toxic bait. And so we had to bring at least 80 to 85% of the wood hens into, into captive management during the eradication. So we first caught as many currawongs as we could, and then we worked in with the Lord Howe Island board and with a team of people, went to the tops of the mountains, top of Mount Gower, Mount Lichbird, right over the back, a remote area called Big Slope. We had teams of people sweeping the settlement, collecting up wood hen. We're on uh, Big Slope. Been out of the uh, site where we brought the pot in about 10 minutes, going up slope. And just not a sound of woodies at the moment, except for our little music machine. And the country's getting very steep. Two-handed climbing job, mate. Up and up. Yeah, I'm up here. Yep. Yeah, I can hear him. Oh, I see him ready. Coming towards me, coming towards Scotty. Second that. Okay. Oh. Here, going. Someone got a bag. Got it, got it, got it. Got it, got it. Good. Well done. One breed and third, nice. Just get this bird processed and I'll grab it. No worries, mate, thank you. How are you doing? Another four. The box is uh, loaded with eight wood hen. 
and we're just awaiting uh, the possibility of the pilot to be able to come and do a pickup. Well, we've done it. It's the last day of uh, bird collections and we're here on Big Slope. We're after 15 birds in three hours and in the last five minutes we've got the last bird. To ensure that at-risk species weren't impacted by the baiting program, uh, the board engaged Taronga Zoo to captive manage wood hens and currawong. Taking these rare birds into our care was a very, very large prospect. So Taronga's component of the program really was to design a, a captive management plan and design a facility that we could ship over to the island and build it and then look after all the animals once they were handed to us for the duration of the project. For the Karawongs being flighted birds, we kept them in aviaries. We built 70 aviaries. The uh, Lord Howe Island wood hens not flighted, so we kept them in large open pens. We handpicked around 30 Taronga staff to go over there on a, on a rotating basis and um, the keepers, obviously experienced keepers, learned how to look after wood hens and how to feed the currawongs. And then at the end of the project, we gave all the birds a really thorough health check. So the baiting program involved placement of over 22,000 bait stations at 10 metre grids, including stations within every house. They were checked uh, weekly. That involved placing each bait station at a geo-reference point, cleaning it and servicing it and entering all that data into a handheld device. Hand broadcast method involved walking along transects and broadcasting bait at a, at a said sowing rate. In the remote areas, the bushland areas, bait was outside of the settlement. Bait was applied through uh, helicopters um, with a hopper and they would sow bait at a, at a certain rate. They had two drops. Um, the first rate was about 12 kilo per hectare and the second one was about eight kilo per hectare. That was all geo-referenced and calibrated and post drops we had teams going out checking breakdown rates, looking for uh, carcasses to see how the bait was interacting with the environment. Uh, it was probably the most uh, technically uh, intricate rodent eradication done uh, globally. We had to start the eradication by bringing birds into captivity. We had to monitor the wild birds in the environment and we walked over 500 kilometres around the island during the baiting period, looking for dead birds, monitoring how they were coping with the bait being around. We also had to monitor how the bait broke down because we couldn't re-release our birds 
until all the toxic bait that had been dropped by helicopters was broken down. So we ran bait at breakdown stations. We also needed to know how fast dead rats broke down because we knew currawongs were eating dead rats. And so we had to get regularly collected rats and keep a sample of them until the last regular rats we got, we then put out in cages and watched how long it took for them to break down because then we could release the currawongs again. A part of, part of the work that we did during the eradication was actually to monitor the impact of bait on a whole range of systems. We monitored the quality of the water. We monitored seawater for water quality as well for Bredificum going into it. We monitored breakdown of bait in soil pastures, in rainforest and in exposed sites around the island. So we were like the eyes and ears of how the natural environment on Lord Howe was coping with the use of Bredificum as the eradication tool. The results of all our monitoring during the eradication was there was no impact on water, there was no impact on soils, The release of the birds was done very cautiously after the eradication was complete. We wanted to get the wood hens back into the mountains as soon as we could because we knew originally that they would start breeding in October. So we would like to get them out as quickly as we could. Our lowland wood hens could not be released until it was safe. But the first wood hens to get out were the ones that went to the mountains while the helicopters were here for other work. One chopper, I took a load of birds just up to Lichbird. There are only five birds from Lichbird. We released them out into the bush there. 56. Okay, buddy. And 52. Oh, you're ready to go. There you go, mate. Enjoy your life and then we took a whole pot of birds up to Gower and we carried them back out across the forest where we found them and released them. And what was really interesting was we thought all wood hen that we had missed would have died. We found there were at least eight birds calling in the forests, despite the fact that we'd put all this baiting across the island. So the currawongs were a different kettle of fish. They're a lowland bird. Once we knew that there were no rodents surviving in the lowlands, and we knew that the carcasses of the last live rodents had broken down, that allowed us to release the first lot of currawongs. We radio tracked these birds and the birds were copulating within a day of being released and building nests within the week of being released while they're still being radio tracked. But the currawongs did quite well. And then once we tracked them for a couple of weeks and we were satisfied that they were carrying on naturally, which they appeared to be, we then released the rest of the currawongs, which once you open a box of a currawong who's ready to go, they're gone really quick. That's more like it. In terms of achieving what we achieved through the REP, that was community centric. Like without them, we could not have done it. Now that we've been through all of that, we have a real responsibility to ensure biosecurity. Post the rodent eradication program, we installed a monitoring network of 310 stations around the settlement. We've had uh, biosecurity processes for the Island Trader, which is our main cargo ship. Uh, for quite some time now, but we have been working on increasing those processes as well. And we have a dog check on the 
Port Macquarie side um, and we also check it, check every piece of cargo on this side with the dogs as well. It's very obvious that things are happening and the exciting part to me too is, um, and I tell this to the tourists, there's, there's nobody, there's nobody around today alive on Lord Howe who can actually tell us what it was like here before rodents. So it's sort of every little corner you turn, there could be some, some new discovery. Rodents pretty much went for everything. But now, in a short turnaround with the removal of rodents, what we're seeing is a large production of seed and flowers held on trees. Here we've got the Kentia palm. Finding these fruits red and to be able to pick them off the ground, you would not have been able to do that historically. So what has been amazing is just seeing um, some of the common plants on the island actually flowering and fruiting. And talking to some of the uh, older islanders, they haven't seen those plants flower or fruit before. It's quite a pretty thing to actually witness the changes with um, rodents being absent from the environment. I'm regularly seeing now flocks of like 50 silver eyes. They'll jump out of an area and fly through. So yeah, that's the bird life is absolutely starting to increase. Um, we're getting breeding success of about 70%. And so uh, even a little bit higher than what you would expect for a petrol population. Um, you know, it's definitely um, at or above what you would expect for petrols now. And no sign of rats. There's so much seed up there. Like I sort of had a bet with one of the doubters before the program. I said, I'll put a thousand dollar cash on the table. Uh, if you can go into the valley there and get me a um, bag full of curly palm seed, my money would have been safe. You know, they didn't show up with a bag of seed. My money would go now. There's seed everywhere in there. Like, there's bags. There's not one bag. There's bags and bags of seed in there already. You know, I wouldn't bet on it now. <laughs> I'd call it an ecological renaissance. Every night I hear crickets calling. Uh, you'd hear crickets calling once or twice a year and they'd only call for a short time now. Crickets call every night. I walk around the bush, I see seedlings germinating. The bird numbers have exploded. This is post-rat bounce back from uh, the rats being removed. Now we've got the forest floor totally flush. Oh, it's an amazing feeling. When I go through the forest on, on the mountain walk, I'm sort of still in a bit of disbelief because for the last 25 years, whenever I've walked up to Mount Gare in the forest there, I've seen nearly every three or four metres there would be a rat drop on, on a rock. There'd be palm seeds being chewed on the ground. There's, or, or you would physically see a rat run across the path I've been absolutely looking as hard as I can every trip up there and I can't find one sign of, of damage. So it's just just amazing, it's blowing me away, you know. I'm still, I'm still sort of pinching myself thinking, you know, that surely there's something left over, but it looks like it's clean as. So another species we've been looking at, Pseudocropa ledgeverdi, over the last couple of years, we've been surveying for this species and we've found it at low numbers, some four records, six records. This last year, we found 73 individuals across a number of sites. So it's a, a really strong sign that this species is potentially recovering from, from rodent predation. The largest number of wood hens found prior to the eradication was 250 birds. When they resurveyed them 10 months later, there were found there were 443. When they resurveyed again in the following March, so only about 14 months after the initial release, there were 600. 
I think we have a, a great future ahead, particularly to reintroduce birds, some of the birds that are that were uh, pushed to extinction. I'm sure some will come back naturally themselves. Some of the seabirds, like the Kermadec petrel, the little white-bellied storm petrel. But uh, yeah, it's exciting to see what happens in the, in the future. This is the sound of a white-bellied storm petrel. It's the only recording in the world of this species. And they occur out on Roach Island and they haven't been able to breed here in the Northern Hills. And what we want to do is over there on Roach, they're in such competition with other burrowing seabirds, there's no habitat for them. Terry and I just did a check. There was no breeding there this year. So we've created artificial storm petrel habitat and we're playing the mother of all love songs for them to bring them in. I've done eradications on uh, about seven or eight islands now in New South Wales. The change is profound. So we end up with more crabs in rock pools. We end up with greater numbers of seedlings. We're getting insights into vast numbers of invertebrates. We're getting blackwing petrels turning up in people's yards, prospecting where they never saw blackwing petrels before. We're getting masked boobies turning up on the island shoreline, wanting to breed because they don't have rats crawling over them every night so they can actually stop and actually set up new breeding sites. Things are changing. We've got offshore islands where seabirds are being forced to live because they cannot survive here. And we're hoping to attract some of them back to the island to speed things up. Some will come back themselves. We're gonna see an explosion of our seabirds. That's number one. Yeah, well, if we hadn't done anything, I think we would have eventually would have lost some of the forest for sure. I mean, you could see areas that we, there was no regeneration at all and all you had was mature trees and gaps in the forest. And so I think the risk of doing nothing would be an eventual you know, loss of large areas of the forest and, and perhaps eventually um, losing it completely. Getting rid of the rats, we've just, um, first of all, allowed the forest to recover, but also allow all of those other species to you know, reach their potential and their more natural population levels on the island. I think we've achieved something really amazing. But to see the results so quickly and so obviously, um, I think we have really made a difference and really you know, saved species from extinction, maybe saved the forest from extinction because you know, we are now seeing the recovery in a very short period of time.